It is good to be back with you all. So I have two quick things to tell you before we get into the message. Uh, the first is um, I was traveling down the road without a shirt. And I walked into this Baptist church and they gave me a shirt. So uh, it is a good day. No, the truth of that actually is I did have one Lone Oak shirt. It was given to me several years ago when I preached I believe we were over here at the school for a homecoming service, I think. And, um, of course, Brother David was here at the time, and they gave Shirley and I both T-shirts. Well, here's the deal. I did look at it this week when I found out this was T-shirt week, and I realized, you don't want me to wear this shirt. <laughs> it has been worn, let's say, a lot. And, you know, you, there's T-shirts, and then there's T-shirts that have worked their way down the scale, right? Right. And uh, so it gets used for other things now, uh, but it was well worn. So I am grateful to have a new shirt today. The second thing is, uh, uh, it, I'm delighted to uh, d get to talk every so often with Brother Roger. He is enjoying being your interim pastor. You all are treating him well. And uh, I am delighted that he is here and, and can serve you all in that role. Uh, and so as we uh, stay in touch about that, I want you to know I regularly am praying for you all and uh, look forward to seeing what God is going to do. I've also had a couple opportunities to talk to the pastor search committee and uh, just begin to see as they get ramped up and get going, we are praying that God's very best for Lone Oak will come out of that process. Uh, I really should say one other thing on the lighter side. Uh, my house has turned into a little bit of a tornado lately. We have two children. Uh, we have a daughter who's uh, 29. She's been married seven years and have a son who's not yet married. But my daughter just publicly announced uh, two or three weeks, a couple weeks ago, I don't know, uh, that she was expecting a baby in December. And so if you can just imagine, my wife went into a different kind of mode about that time. I never saw such a thing. There's sewing going on. There's all kinds of planning going on. Uh, we spent Memorial Day with my son-in-law's parents, and, and we were all, they were, I mean, there was all kind of planning going on. So anyway, uh, good things around our house. Anyway, well, it is good to be with you. I want you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in a moment in verse 37, a message entitled, Getting Back to Basics. Uh, one of the things that is good for all of us to do from time to time is to go back and read the instructions. And when you think about what it is to be a church, a New Testament Bible-believing church in any um, context that our world knows, Acts is a great place to start and so I want you to see in this, this passage, in, beginning in Acts 2, and we're going to pick up in verse 37, I want you to see some things that God shows us through His Word about the way that the early church behaved and what they believed, and the connection between the two. So if you're able and can stand for the reading of God's Word, I'd ask you to do that. We're reading from the hand of the, of the writer Luke uh, who writes here in Acts chapter 2, verse 37 and following. Now, when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart, and they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? Peter said to them, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received the word, his word were baptized. And that day there were added about 3,000 souls. There, they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all who had believed were together and had all things in common.' 
And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all as anyone might have need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Let's pray together. Father and God, we are grateful for the opportunity to open your word. Lord, we're grateful for the way that your, your word speaks to us. We're grateful for the way that it teaches us and for the way it shapes us. I pray, Lord, that as we've offered praise to you through music today, I pray that you might help us to offer ourselves, our hearts and our minds, as we hear from your word. Hide me behind the cross and guide us in all that we do this morning, that we might not simply be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So Shirley and I were at a gathering of my counterparts who work for associations across the state of Tennessee a couple weeks ago, and we had gathered for an assembly over in the Smoky Mountains. And uh, one of our speakers was a guy named Tony Rankin. Tony uh, is a great brother in Christ and works in conjunction with the Tennessee Baptist Mission Board. And one of the things that Tony does is he does a form of Christian counseling. And especially his counseling often uh, provides counseling for pastors and pastors' families, which is a wonderful blessing there. But Tony was sharing a story in the context of that gathering about his own experience with his grandfather. And he talked about the fact that when he was growing up, he used to love to go fishing in the river that went close to the farm where his grandparents lived all of Tony's life, all, all of Tony's memory. And so uh, all through his growing up, he had fond memories, and it was not complicated fishing. They were using a, a bamboo cane pole and, uh, you know, that kind of fishing. And uh, there was sort of a hole at the edge of the river, and uh, they, they loved to catch fish in that sort of secret place that they could, could catch those fish. But by the time Tony got well up into high school, his granddaddy, uh, was not doing too well. Uh, he had what in the old days we call the hardening of the arteries. Some older folks might recognize that term. Now we probably call that something like dementia or Alzheimer's. But as uh, Tony was going up through high school and saw his granddaddy's uh, condition sort of deteriorate, he would still go and visit him every so often. And uh, so probably early college, like his freshman year in college, he remembered one sort of final big uh, opportunity to visit his granddaddy. And while he was there, he walked in the door and his grandmother greeted him and she just said to him, now Tony, you just need to know granddaddy's not well today. And he's, he's just talking about some stuff that just, it just, it's just sort of out there. And so I just want to prepare you. And so he went in, and sure enough, his granddaddy was, was talking about all kinds of things. And he said one of the things he said is he, he kept talking about this, this sort of spaceship that had landed on their front yard. And there were, you know, people out there and so on. And, and so already Tony's in his mind thinking, oh, man, this is, this is a bad day, you know. He's just not with it. And so he said he, uh, then he kind of went from one story to another. And, and he said, uh, Tony, did I tell you about going fishing the other day? And Tony said, no, granddaddy, you didn't tell me about that. Said, uh, tell me about fishing. He said, well, I caught a 22-inch trout. And Tony said, wow, that's awesome. But then he got to thinking, and he thought, you know, the area where they used to fish is all grown up now. And you can, you really, it would be very hard to get down there. And so he said, granddaddy, he said, that's great. But he said, I got to ask you, he said, how did you get down there to fish? You know, it's kind of grown up. And he said, I used a machete. And he said, really? He said, yeah. He said, well, uh, and, he, and he told about this fish and how excited he was to catch this big fish. And Tony just, you know, patted him on the hand and said, you know, granddaddy, I'm, I'm really glad to hear that. I'm glad you had a good day fishing. And then he went on. His granddaddy passed away. And a year or so later, Tony was at his grandparents' house and his grandmother, uh, 
was cleaning out the deep freeze. And while she was, while he was there, she said, Tony, I've been meaning to ask you about this. And she pulls a fish out of the deep freeze that measured 22 inches long. Now, I tell you that story, crazy things happen in life, don't they? But here's the deal. I often wonder, in the modern day, with all the modern media that we have, how often is it that you and I look at the things that are written in God's Word, and we sort of just pat the Bible on the proverbial hand and say, that's nice that that happened. It's nice you're telling me that story, but I live in the modern day. And I just believe that it's possible <clears throat> that if we're not careful, we are dismissing a lot of what God is telling us in God's Word. And so we hear a story of some 3,000 souls that were added to the family of God uh, right after Pentecost or right at the Pentecost time. And maybe we look at that and think, oh my goodness, how, how could that have been? I mean, 3,000 people, really. How did they count all those people, right? But here's the deal. When we look at Scripture, Scripture is true and reliable. And it is calling us back sometimes to look deeper into what it says so that we can see where God wants to take us. And so the passage that you and I have read this morning <clears throat> comes immediately on the heels of Peter preaching at Pentecost. There's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit and people are understanding in their own native tongue somehow under God's power, they're understanding, and they are turning to God. And so, as you and I picked up our reading, when they've heard that message, they are being spoken to, the Scripture says, they were pierced to the heart. And so, they said, you know, what are we supposed to do here? What's supposed to be our response and so, when you look at this passage that we see today, I want to show you uh, about five things that you and I are taught in this passage of Scripture. The first thing I want you to see is that the early church had a grasp on the gospel of Jesus Christ. They came to understand and trust and profess the gospel of Jesus. And church, here's what I want you to know about that. The same gospel they shared in the first century still works today. And so, let's begin to look at what Peter says as they are responding here in verse 38. Peter said to them, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so I want you to see a few things there. There are four specific things that he's saying about the gospel. First of all, he's saying we should turn from our sin. We should repent. A couple ways to look at that. One of the meanings of that is literally to change your mind. And so we are to change our mind about sin. Not only are we to change our mind, but we are to change our direction. We are to make a U-turn. We're headed this way, now we're headed this way. And so that word is used for repent. Now one other thing before I move on from that. Simply this. God does not call us to clean up our lives and then come to Jesus. He calls us to come to Jesus, and Jesus cleans up our lives. But that process of repentance is so key, because if all we do is share with people, God loves you, we have not told them the whole gospel. And so what you and I see here is that Peter is very clear to say that we need to repent. Why? Because for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Also because for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God 
is eternal life. And so when you and I look at that, there is a picture of repentance. And then he says after this, repent each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. The baptism picture here is not a magical thing that takes place when we get wet. It's not magical water. But it is the first of a set of steps of obedience. It is a way of saying to people around us, I have surrendered to Jesus. Now, one quick note about that. In Baptist life, we very often have an altar call or an invitation. That's wonderful. Nothing wrong with that, okay? But hear me clearly. The profession of your faith as a believer is not necessarily walking an aisle. It is being baptized in obedience to Jesus. And the reason that's important is because as I've traveled around the world, I have found that in some ways, baptism in other cultures has an almost higher stature than what we see. I think about baptizing along with a, a good friend of mine from Pleasant View Baptist Church on one of our trips to India. We were baptizing. We baptized 33 people that day. I'm in a river. There's a guy behind me holding on to my belt so I don't sweep away with the river, and a guy holding on to Jim's belt as, so he doesn't sweep away. We're taking turns baptizing people. But here's the deal, and I, I thought carefully about this as I baptized each person. We would put our hands on top of their head and pray over them, and we would call them very often by a new name. They were changing their name as they became a follower of Jesus. But I was reminded that every one of those people we were baptizing was aware that immediately after their baptism, they were going to face some persecution. And so it was a big step to be baptized in the name of Jesus. And so, huge thing. One other quick thing I want to mention about that. The scripture says in this verse here, repent and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus, catch this, for the forgiveness of your sins. Now, we'll catch there. I don't want you to get caught on. And that is the word for. It uh, can mean a couple of different things, but one of the key meanings of that is on account of. It's a little word, E-I-S is our transliteration for that. It literally means we are baptized on account of. In other words, because we've been forgiven, we are being baptized. So the second thing is baptism. It's obedience. The third thing is Notice what he's saying, for the forgiveness of your sins. You and I are given the gift of God's grace. What a wonderful gift that is. We can never earn our way to heaven. If we have sinned, we are guilty before God. But because of the forgiveness of what Jesus did for us on the cross, we have that gift of God's grace. And by the way, that process of forgiveness can still set people free because one of the things that leads people to destructive, terrible behaviors in their lives very often are the voices of guilt and shame for where they've been in their past. But when you and I experience God's grace, it sets us free. And then you'll notice he's very clear to say something else. He says, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It is not a secondary thing. When you and I come to trust Jesus Christ as Savior, the Holy Spirit comes to live in us. It's a wonderful gift. It's the down payment, if you will, of what is taking place in our lives. Now, when you and I come to church on a Sunday morning and we hear a message that shares the gospel, we don't just need to think, oh, wow, I've, I've already been saved. I don't need to hear that sermon. Listen, as believers, it is good for us to hear the gospel, to rehear it, to remind us of what God has done in our lives, how he's changed us and how he set us free. Oh, it's good for us to hear once again and have a grasp of the gospel. Would you also notice that as the verses go on, and I'm speeding this up because I, I could spend all day here, but notice he specifically says, be saved from this perverse generation. The church, 
If Peter was saying that about the culture then, what is he saying about the culture today? We need people to be set free by the power of Jesus today. And so he is reminding us of the need for us to know him. The second thing I want you to see is that the early church did not just have a grasp of the gospel, but there are four things listed in verse 42 that show us what that early church looked like. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching. What is that? Well, that is another word for what you and I would call discipleship. They were being discipled, in this case, with the teaching that was coming to them from the apostles. Why? Because they didn't have a printed New Testament then. The New Testament began in the very beginning to come in pieces and parts. The gospel written here, a gospel written there, a letter here, a letter there, so on. You and I have that combined into a, a book form today. But they had Old Testament teaching that was being passed on from the apostles. And especially the way that Jesus fit that Old Testament teaching and prophecy. They also were being taught about the life and ministry and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. And then they were also being taught about how to share their faith and how to live out their faith. And so the teaching of the apostles was teaching pla taking place in that early church. A uh, couple of quick things there. Never forget this. What we believe dictates what we do. Now I want you to think about that. What we believe dictates what we do. If you want to know what somebody really prioritizes in their lives, look on their credit card statements and their checkbook. You will quickly find out what the priorities are in that person's life. Another way to look at that is just do a log of your time over a given week. You'll begin to see what you believe in and what you value. And so what he's showing us here is if we really want to be sure that we are following Jesus, we need to be listening to the teaching of the apostles. And so that discipleship, by the way, is not merely a class. You don't just take a class and you're done being discipled, right? It is an ongoing process for a follower of Jesus all of their lives, not simply that you and I can memorize this or learn this, but so that you and I look more and more like Jesus. And so the process of discipleship was taking place in that early church. Now, I am old enough that I remember in Baptist life, we used to have a thing called church training. And back in the day when churches had, every church had a worship service on Sunday night, those who were really spiritual came an hour early. And they went to church training. And then they went to church after that. And a little later on, they changed that to discipleship training. And now we do that in a bunch of different ways. But here's the deal. It isn't based on what the exact methodology is. It's based on are we learning how to be a follower of Jesus. It is a lifelong process. And when we think about the way that looks, it ought to shape the desires of our hearts to be looking more and more like Jesus. So they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship. Now, this was a Baptist church in Acts, and so they were periodically having potluck suppers, right? No, that's not what we're talking about, okay? The word fellowship is a word that you may have heard before, even if you've never studied the Greek of any kind. It is the word koinonia. And it literally means something like this. It means to have in common or to, ha uh, to have a shared purpose, to be in close relationship together. There was something that marked the early church as being a different kind of people. And one of that, one of those things, was this sense of koinonia, this fellowship together. The word is used 19 times in the New Testament. And when we look at what it is teaching us, it is saying that people were living in relationship. Why? Because the local church was not man's idea, it was God's idea. God's idea. 
And so when we think about God's idea, why is it important that we have the local church? It's important because in, the, in an unsaved secular culture, you and I regularly need to be with other believers to be encouraged and supported, but also to have a sense of accountability, to have a sense of responsibility to be together. Now, just a couple quick things about that before I move on. Remember this. Part of fellowship is not just sitting around a table and having a potluck supper. Sometimes it's dealing with hard issues. Sometimes part of fellowship is getting the right people together so they can pray through, talk through, whatever, a process and say, what does God want in this situation? It means sometimes that we come together, usually in very small groups, to deal with conflict so it doesn't destroy the local body of believers. So fellowship is not just this sort of slap you on the back and shake your hand thing and smile at you. It is also a process of godly accountability together. One more thing here. They were devoting themselves to apostles' teaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread. Now, they obviously were sharing meals together. Probably the evening meal, they were coming together as they would work all day and they would share that meal together. It is extremely likely that they were at the end of many of those meals adding on to that what you and I would call the Lord's Supper. They probably did that a whole lot more often than we do that in our church today, but they added that on to the meal. So the breaking of bread was two things. It was, in a sense, yes, part of the fellowship and the encouragement. It also was meeting some practical needs sometimes, and we know this from Scripture. There are times they were sharing meals together because some of them didn't have enough to eat, but they also were spending some of that time worshiping. They were sharing in the Lord's Supper together, remembering what Jesus had done for them. And so, uh, you know, the old thing in Baptist life is if you feed them, they will come, right? Well, that's biblical. So, you know, you you can think about that. But, But the reality is they were coming together often, and here's why. Because when you get together over a meal together, it's different than just walking by and waving at somebody. You can begin to build relationships with one another. You notice in the the following scriptures right after this, they were probably meeting the temple periodically still in Jerusalem and sharing worship together. But one of the big features of what they were doing is they were in homes together. They were in small groups sharing fellowship, teaching, meals, all that kind of stuff, praying together. Now I want you to notice something else. Into fellowship, the breaking of bread. Now, catch this, it's separate here. And to prayer. Isn't that interesting that doesn't just mention, you know, these big pieces, but prayer? Why? Because prayer was the thing that held it all together. Spending time in God's presence in a sort of communion relationship was key to these young believers making it in a difficult world. It was a key for so many things to take place as they prayed together. And once you think about that, they were specific in their prayer. Sometimes we just pray general things. You know, God bless America and God bless my family. And that's okay, but we ought to be praying specifically for things. Let me share with you another part of that. When they prayed together, it was not what we would call an organ recital. They were not simply praying for sick people. Nothing wrong with praying for people who are ill or who are grieving a loss. Don't hear me say that. What I am saying is they were praying for a lot of other things too. If you look at the model prayer from Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount, it's a reminder that he was praying for big things. He was praying for thy kingdom come, thy will be done. He was praying that God would, would guide them through times of temptation. He was praying for, they were praying for all kinds of things like that. And so as you and I think about this emphasis on prayer, it was a mark of that early church. You know why that's so important? 
because God still does miracles. Our God is still a miracle-working God. And sometimes, in God's will and purpose, people are physically healed. But sometimes, the saving of a person's soul is an even bigger miracle. And so what we see is they were so focused on making sure they were spending time in prayer together that it shaped that early church. And can I just challenge you as a church family here? That is still true. When we pray together, God does amazing things. So awesome. I was heard a story just this week of a situation, and, and I was talking with a brother, and, and he was talking about somebody, and, and they, would, they prayed together sometimes. And, and then this one time when they got together to pray over a certain situation, the person that they were with didn't pray. They just wept because God was changing that person's heart. They were now not just saying words. They were seeing what God was teaching them and showing them. And when we surrender to God in prayer, amazing things happen. Isn't it amazing how it's so easy to do everything else except pray? I mean, you have to focus on, I'm going to spend this time talking to God. Now, that doesn't mean you can't pray on the fly, so to speak, and that kind of thing. But I'm telling you, it takes a focus to stop and pray. And so when you and I look at this, this picture of the pattern, these back-to-basics ideas, can I, can I just remind you of a couple of things that are obvious? They didn't have seminaries back then. They didn't have LifeWay printing VBS materials back then. They didn't have big sending organizations like IMB and these other things, MVN and so on, to send missionaries. But they were doing all that God wanted them to do by getting down to basics. And I just believe with all my heart, church, when we get back to basics, God does amazing things. And so let me ask you something. Are we willing to allow God to call us back to the pattern? Are we willing to allow God not to call us, but to call me back to the pattern? Are we willing to follow the blueprint? God is at work. The key is, are we open to whatever it is He wants to do? I want to close with these thoughts. For a church to get back to basics, one of the things we have to do is we have to hurt for where people hurt. Our city mayor shared with a group of pastors a few months ago five things that keep him awake at night. This is what he said. One of the things he said, I'm not going to go through all, but one of the things he said is the spirit of suicide. And he talked about the reports that he gets from law enforcement and other sources of stories and, and numbers of suicide across our community. Folks, the enemy is at work. When we hurt for where people hurt, we can turn them to God. Praying with expectation. Praying with expectation. Evangelism that permeates everything we do. And making sure that membership in the church family is actually meaningful. Meaningful. Not just coming because this is where our friends are. Not just coming because this is a beautiful building, and it is a beautiful building but being here because this is what God has called us to do. And so this morning, as we share a time of invitation, I want to challenge you to think about this. First of all, I want to encourage you this week to go back and read this passage again. So much more than I could get to today. But one of the things you see is that God was changing their relationships with the people around them. God was giving them an opportunity to connect with people around them. But I, I want to encourage you to, to do that this week. Go back and read this passage. Secondly, when we share a time of invitation, if you'd like to come this morning and share a decision with me, I'll be glad to pray with you about that and share that with the church family. But some of you just may want to come and pray. Because you know what? It's never too late 
as a family of God to just say, God, we want to come back to the blueprint. We want to come back to what you've called us to do. And when we do that, he does amazing things. So in a moment, we're going to share a time of invitation. When we do that, I want to encourage you to have the courage to respond. Would you stand with me as we pray? Father and God, we thank you so much for the opportunity and privilege of worship. We thank you for the way that you are so good to us. And Father, in these moments today, I pray that you'd speak to our hearts or that you'd remind us of the ways you've already spoken to us today. Lord, if there's a decision that needs to be prayed, a prayer that needs to be offered, help us, Lord, to be obedient to you in these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. You come if God leads you this morning.